Hello, you've reached Lisa Talking again, and we have come to the second part in our series about what's keeping the UK stable as we kind of head, march into a post-coronavirus, post-Brexit, post-Trump world, where the perceived dominance of the UK and the US that defined the post-war Washington consensus for the latter half of the 20th century is over. And while the economics that defined, that shaped our actions for the last quarter of the 20th century, neoliberal economics, is also as dead as a dodo. So in this video, we're gonna look at the UK's relationship with both the US and the EU. And it cannot have escaped your notice that the UK voted to leave the European Union and threatened global stability while we did it. So within this analysis, there are lessons for the rest of the world in how complacency and how a media class who cannot adapt to the context that's changed around them and how a failure to adapt economics when the context has changed around it can generate risk and instability that threatens the world without knowing that they've done it. Now, the referendum to leave the European Union had absolutely no reason. It was offered by a prime minister called David Cameron, who was a conservative. And he offered it not knowing how it would be delivered, not knowing what it would mean to deal with a very minor threat from a fringe party called the UK Independence Party, who were motivated by, primarily by a desire to leave the European Union. Now, this was a fringe political party made up of ex-Tory donors, um, swivel-eyed loons, wannabe fascists, and people too deranged for the Conservative Party. And they had been fundamentally rejected at the ballot box pretty much every time in the UK, and they posed no electoral threat at all. But they were portrayed as a political force by the BBC, who gave them a more or less permacy in their mainstream current affairs programming, Question Time, Newsnight, This Week, and The Daily Politics, because of their proximity to existing Westminster media cultures and the Conservative Party. Both Labour and the Conservatives used UKIP as shorthand for an imaginary racist white working class who didn't exist, as shorthand for their disconnection with voters, and as a way to project out and justify their own racism. The existence of UKIP meant, meant we needed ever harsher immigration policies, ever harsher welfare policies that suited them. UKIP had been fundamentally rejected at every opportunity apart from the European elections to the European Parliament they claimed to oppose. Now, the referendum campaigns themselves highlighted massive amounts of dysfunction within Westminster and localised dysfunction, and the question of whether we should leave the European Union unfortunately tapped into some deep-rooted division within UK society. But the campaigns were separate from that deep-rooted issues. Now, the, predominantly, the first campaign was overseen by a man called Dominic Cummings, the Leave campaign, and he used the mantra, take back control, an overtly fascist mantra, and digital techniques, including data mining of Facebook, in a way that he told everybody was revolutionary, but which was just blowing very predictable dog whistles. This was backed up by a campaign with the UKIP people at its core, which used, which employed overtly fascist imagery. Now, the problem was that the one thing that these campaigns demonstrated and the, the kind of period of campaigning was that the UK had a fundamental ignorance about what the European Union was. The Remain campaign was essentially kind of smug Westminster media types misinforming people about what the European Union was and telling people if they knew what was good for them, they would vote Remain. Their campaign alone generated a reaction, which meant that people voted leave. Now, the European Union is an economic and political union of 27 European countries. It came into being as part of a series of treaties, beginning with the Treaty of Rome, to establish a single market. It was never anything to do with democracy, it's about market making. Now, this single market was about economic cooperation being driven by political cooperation and was about learning the lessons of World War II. But it was also about moving on. Europe had been a continent who for, who for a thousand years previously had done little else but go to war with each other. And this was about learning that economic cooperation was necessary. Now, the UK, because we occupy a position as an island off Europe, we have our own financial system, our own currency, and we also occupy this position as an Atlantic bridge between the US and Europe, hadn't immediately joined. 
But over the time, over time, these institutions and relationships are developed. And by the time you get to the post-1992 Maastricht Treaty period, the EU has a core seven institutions. The European Parliament, which we had all confused, said, thought was just the EU, was just that. The European Council and the Council of the European Union, simply known as the Council, one of these is just for the heads of state. The European Commission, the Court of Justice of the European Union, which is nothing to do with the European Court of Human Rights and the European Central Bank. Now, in the 10 years preceding the referendum, both Europe and the UK had by reflex as a response to the financial crisis implemented austerity programs using an economics with outdated data modelling at its core and kind of blind to um, the rule of law, to debt, to financialization, and to the institutions that evolved within Europe as part of our political economy and within your, the UK in the last quarter of the 20th century. This austerity program hacked at those institutions and actually generated massive instability. But this, gen this manifested very differently in Europe to the UK. In the UK, it resulted in the death of the Labour Party and the deaths of about 100,000 people. In Europe, this exposed fundamental structural problems with the, EU, with the European Union itself and inequality between member nations. So the European Union has a currency of its own, the euro, but they don't have a reserve because of what the European Union is. It's a lot of different countries. So instead, they have a European Central Bank. The expansion of financialization under austerity had expanded the power of the European Central Bank and had raised questions about democracy itself. Several European leaders were replaced with technocrats. Inequality between member nations had become a problem. A group of nations were described as pigs and subject to real harsh draconian austerity measures. And it was perceived that countries like Germany with power were above this. But this inequality and these problems had been exacerbated by UK membership of the EU. We were treated as very much top tier players, but exempt from many of the responsibilities that other, UK mem that other EU member nations had. In addition, we were fairly seen as stymieing essential reform in the European Union around financial reform, around social policy and further integration to address this inequality because basically we were sending like loons like UKIP out to the European par Parliament and as a country we fundamentally did not understand the value of EU membership for us. Now, in the period after the referendum, the political dysfunction that had been highlighted by the referendum campaigns was intensified. In the night of the referendum, what was revealed was a lot of fault lines in the UK system where Westminster had lost touch with the country it served because of the media culture generating this problem. But immediately Westminster went into denial and started whipping up a binary about leavers and remainers to pretend this had not happened. Um, the opposition party, who should have been holding government to account at this point, Jeremy Corbyn immediately said trigger Article 50 without, for his own ideological reasons and prevented his political party from holding the government to account. But he also employed power illegitimately over social movements to prevent normal protest about this. John Macdonald, the shadow chancellor, had his own supporters outside his own MP's office calling them traitors as part of a war in the Labour Party, even though a Labour MP, Jo Cox, had been murdered outside her office during the, the referendum campaign by somebody calling her a traitor. In addition, he sent protesters out to Parliament Green to project an image of instability in the days after when it was essential that the world saw us as a stable country. The problem was that this led to Theresa May, the Prime Minister who took over, being fundamentally badly advised and she triggered Article 50 without knowing what it was, without knowing it would tie her to a negotiation timetable and without knowing that the UK did not have negotiators because this was an EU function. The EU had to treat formal negotiations over the exit as, a, as an opportunity to, to, to contain the UK and let us dance our way out of the door, and our negotiators may as well have pissed in a plant pot on the way out. 
But these formal negotiations, while and the actions of our opposition, they had the impact of making sure that the UK was synonymous with uncertainty and risk for the first time in a very long time. Our housing market is very overvalued and we have a financial centre that is dependent on our reputation for stability. Investors following the financial crisis had invested in London property because we were a safe haven. This blew our global reputation for stability overnight and this will take decades to return. This is very, very, very serious. But outside this problem and this, this dysfunction coming out of Westminster, the British economy itself, its people, its businesses responded very differently. It, British lawyers were drafting clauses into contracts that replicated EU conditions to maintain stability almost immediately. British firms were reaching out to their European partners almost immediately and strengthening those ties. And even though these companies have to wake up to a world where they have been removed from the trading block that's provided stability for a very long time, they are actually in good stead in trying to deal with this. And while we're finding that some firms, I've got somebody who's really annoyed at the pestos that she likes disappearing off the supermarket shelves. And while we do have to face a correction in our housing market, the stability that was created by institutions like the Bank of England has offset the instability generated by Westminster. Now, the problem is that concurrently to this, there were several incidents in the UK. There was um, a, the, a tower block burned down called Grenfell, which, caught, which was just an absolutely shocking tragedy. And this also perpetuated, like, because the Labour Party manufactured a media strategy over this, this was also used to generate more instability. There were two terrorist attacks, one in Manchester and one in London, which again the Labour Party used to generate instability when what they needed to do and what we needed to do was understand that this meant increased, increased cooperation with the EU and with the US was now necessary. But the other thing that happened concurrently was the election of President Trump. And this was a president who was produced by this same Twitter toxicity, this same media culture, media politics toxicity that's kind of over. And this was an overt fascist in the White House. He immediately links to the Brexit campaigns to Nigel Farage. And this energized fascist elements in Europe who felt that they were on the brink of a new fascist wave. Now, in the UK, we have no risk of fascism. We reject it consistently. But in Europe, this is not the case. And it's very, very clear that we will not be forgiven for quite some time because of this. And European unity is now around recognizing that we did this. Now, for the European Union, there are major benefits to the fact that we have danced ourselves off the stage. They are now have had a barrier to further integration removed. They have had a barrier to financial, financial reform removed. They have had a barrier to social policy reform moved. And they are able to start looking down the Eurasian step as the world can and adjust to a multipolar world. But at the point where this began, the UK was sat on the fault line of what's called a Thucydides trap. A Thucydides trap is where the ascendancy of one power and the decline of another has always, without exception in human history, resulted in a war. And we sit here in 2021 actually looking forward to a period of possibly relative stability and prosperity, and I wanted to discuss how that had happened. Now, in the US, kind of, President Trump has proved a test of resilience as well as dysfunction. Joe Biden has been elected, and while he will be continuing to focus on the Pacific Basin as this new multipolar world demands, because President Trump was fostering division between the US and Europe, he will actually be seeking to renew relationships with the UK and will actually find that Boris Johnson, who is a Birkin Conservative One Nation Tory, is intellectually and philosophically aligned with where he is. It's actually aligned with the intersectionality which his supporters will be demanding. Europe have had a barrier to further integration and reform removed and we have had our like the balancing away of our economy from financialization and our housing market will now happen naturally and the Bank of England have maintained stability. This is not good news in Canary Wharf. It's not good news for house prices, but this should happen a lot less chaotically than it was going to.
And the curveball that's finally been thrown into the mix is coronavirus. Coronavirus is a global pandemic. It's a virus that has illustrated how countries are linked even when political walls are up. And it's exposed systems within countries and resilience and strength and weakness within systems around health, around social care. And in actual fact, the UK has done really rather well and it's demonstrated that there are many features of our system that have meant that we are able to transition crisis with stability. But the key, prob the key issue with coronavirus is that every country in the world is now going to issue some form of post-coronavirus economic stimulus. And the cumulative impact of this will generate an economic boom. It is this, with the ascendancy of powers in the Middle East and of um, the uh, you know, acknowledgement of the importance of China and the kind of abdication of the role of the policeman of the world by the US by Trump and the renewed political stability between Europe, the US and the UK, which actually mean that we should now be facing a much more stable, much more prosperous future. The UK is fully able to redefine its place in the world, has danced itself out from primacy on the world stage at a point where we need to, and now has to adjust to a world where many of the economies in the ascendancy will want to discuss the failures of UK foreign policy and will be able to do so without us responding badly. It's going to take us a very long time to restore our reputation for stability, but we are actually a stable, pragmatic country and are more than able to do this. And the media dysfunction in the UK around Westminster has locked itself in circles on Twitter. And this is dysfunction that's shared not just here, but in the US and in Europe. And all these political cultures are finding they're in a digital landscape where people can bypass them and publish without them. This video is an example of that. Now next week I will be looking at how the global context has changed while we have been focused on this and at some of the tests that will face us as we head into this new future. And on Sunday, as part of my history playlist, looking at what we misleadingly call the Silk Road, I'll be looking at ancient Mesopotamia or Iraq in a, a two-part video entitled From Eden to Iraq. That will come out on Sunday. I will be uploading on a Wednesday and a Sunday every week. I'm still crowdfunding £350 for research materials and equipment to improve these videos. And you can actually, I've discovered that Patreon is a really lovely platform for somebody who doesn't use Instagram, Twitter or Facebook to actually talk to people and you can kind of register and talk to me there or you can leave comments underneath this video. Please do share it or don't if you don't want to. Thank you very much for listening to me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Bye-bye.